Okay. Warn us about you. Uh, warn. <laughs> well, um, let's see. I've lived in Austin for six years. I came here to do to go to grad school. Um, my primary focus is working in Greenland, but I've done uh, field work in uh, Switzerland and in the United States as well. Um, before I came to grad school, I spent several years doing environmental consulting and cleaning up abandoned mine uh, sites in California using uh, passive wetland treatment cells, which are essentially these big region, uh, big areas that they fill with uh, cow manure and uh, hay and straw and wood chips. And the sulfate reducing bacteria in the manure uh, strips out the uh, sulfate so it lowers the pH of, or increases the pH of the water. So all of the heavy metals that come out of the mines drop out in these big cells and you're able to pump that water then onto the surface and back into the groundwater. So you're able to go from a pH of two to a pH of about seven, just passively filtering water through. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to talk about something very different than that today. Um, I'm going to be talking about the work that I've done in Greenland um, with a number of colleagues. Um, the title of my talk is Monitoring Greenland, the Why and How We Study the Plumbing. Um, and what I'm really interested in is, first off, I'm not really a climate scientist, but the work that I do is very informed um, from climate science. So obviously glaciers and ice sheets are changing a lot. Um, so I'm looking at how these systems behave naturally and how they behave in response to climate change. And throughout the talk, just feel free to jump in with questions. I wasn't sure how many plots versus how many photos to show. So we've got a lot of field photos and we've got a lot of plots. And we can go back and forth between the two. But feel free to jump in with any questions because I've been known to uh, use a little bit of jargon without really paying attention to it. So if I say something and you don't understand, it's me. It's not you. <laughs> um, so. Uh, actually, pardon me, I'm going to motivate my talk. Um, I always like to motivate my talks using just a photo of, you know, what I do. So this is myself and another grad student. We're out on the Greenland ice sheet. This is in western Greenland. And you can see a lot of different features, despite the fact that it's flat and white, uh, that can affect how the ice sheet behaves uh, in response to a changing climate, right? We have clouds and we have incoming solar radiation. Um, more uh, higher temperatures, more solar radiation uh, results in more melting. Uh, clouds can uh, act as a barrier to that solar radiation reaching the surface of the ice. And then we actually notice that the ice here can range from almost black to almost pure white. And when you have black ice, just like wearing a black shirt during the summer, it's going to absorb more heat. And in fact, you're going to get more melting. And on whiter ice, you're going to reflect a lot more of that solar radiation. So you're going to have a lot less melting occurring. And then we can see all of the water that's been melted off of the surface pouring into this huge hole, um, what we call moulins. And they're called. What's the black? In the, the black, ah, excellent question. It is called cryconite, um, and it's essentially just black carbon that's been output through industrial processes. Um, a lot of this originates from, uh, from the United States. Um, in Antarctica, you can see it, and it's actually becoming a much, much bigger problem in the Himalaya now. So you're getting much darker ice where it used to be white, and so you're getting more rapid melting. Um, I believe the general pattern is coming from China, but I'm not positive on that. Um, you could look it up, or I could look it up. <laughs> um, so this plot is uh, a nice little plot that plots the change in temperature, the change in annual temperature between 1901 and 2012 uh, for the entire globe. And, and where there are white areas, we don't have data for that entire century. Um, and as you can see, we don't have you know, a lot of data for the polar regions. But what's really um, important to note here is that when we move to higher latitudes, um, especially in the northern hemisphere, we see that we're having much more warming. So we're having you know, an increase of temperature of 2.5 degrees versus 1 degree versus 0.5 degrees. Um, so 
as our climate is changing, as we're increasing our air temperatures, we're actually more adversely affecting uh, our Arctic regions, our both Antarctic and Arctic regions. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have data, or the IPCC didn't have data here, but it's also occurring in Antarctica as well. Um, and so when you have warming temperature, you have you know, melting ice in a lot of cases. So here's another plot. Um, this is two decades of data. And this is the cumulative mass loss. And so cumulative mass loss for ice sheets is measured in gigatons, which is one cubic kilometer of water. Um, so uh, a lot more than a swimming pool, that's for sure. Um, and then here on the other y-axis, we have the sea level rise equivalent. And so as we can see, for glaciers, and I always find this really interesting because glaciers are so much smaller than Greenland and Antarctica, but right now, the, the, our small glaciers in the Himalaya, in the Alps, in the United States are being more drastically affected by climate change because they sit at a temperature that is just above or just below zero degrees. So any small perturbation in that air temperature or in those uh, precipitation patterns can result in pretty drastic decline in the size of those glaciers. But then uh, we have Greenland and Antarctica, and we actually expect these to begin to pick up pretty significantly as we add uh, more heat to the atmosphere. Um, but as a glaciologist, I want to learn what this line is going to do, but we can't just interpolate what it's going to do. We can't you know, sort of guess. We have to really understand what these ice sheets are doing. And so we're going to zoom in a little bit on Greenland and talk about how Greenland loses mass. So Greenland has an annual cycle, like a lot of places. It's warmer in the summer, warmer in May through about September, and colder in the winter. We gain mass um, every year, so we're adding snow. But we also have a decline in that amount of snow. So we're, we're removing mass, we're melting. But what's really neat about a lot of the ice sheets and the glaciers is it's not just simply melting. So here we have uh, mass loss comes in sort of two flavors uh, for ice sheets and glaciers. There's just the simple straightforward melting where you have the you know, ice turning to water, but there are also a lot of dynamic processes that are going on. And this video is exhibiting one of those, which is uh, calving. So this is one of the largest outlet glaciers in Greenland. And an outlet glacier is a glacier that terminates into the ocean. And you can see, um, as the ice moves forward, it will calve off. And that rate of calving and how fast this ice is moving is really dependent on the ocean temperature and the air temperature and the amount of melting that's going on. So you have dynamic feedbacks between these two. And then I just want to quickly bring your attention to 2012, which is our, go ahead. No, no, oh, OK, I was going to say, in 2012, we actually had our largest melt. Uh, volume loss in Greenland. It was 520 gigatons. And that's enough uh, water to put uh, about, uh, about a meter of water over the entirety of Texas. So about 32 inches of water over the entirety of Texas is 520 gigatons. I'm looking at the scale on the vertical. Cumulative mass loss. Cumulative mass so loss. Negative mass uh, so this is a, a problem in our, our lovely, uh, 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 in the glaciological community. We often do things like label things as cumulative mass loss, and we're actually talking about gain or, or things. So this is just uh, cumulative mass. And we can see that, you know, here we're, uh, we're about right here, zero, and we're actually, so we're gaining, and then we're dropping, we're gaining, and then we're dropping, we're gaining, and we're dropping. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Steve. Yeah. Uh, where is the ocean? So the ocean is going to be right in here. Okay. So this is the calving front, and this will be, so you can see actually this, uh, this is land, and then right here at that line, you can tell that it's much flatter right there, and that's where the ice comes into the ocean. And so as it pushes forward, it will calve off. And what's really neat about these icebergs is once it restarts, <coughs> They're always, uh, so what happens is they actually, they push forward and see how they roll back and roll forward. That sort of, that dynamic can actually um, trigger more calving. 
So as those icebergs move, they're pushing a lot of force into that water, and that can actually trigger more calving. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Yeah, right here. Uh, if you went straight down up, up there, you'd hit land. If you went straight down here, you'd hit ocean. Um, the cliff right here. Uh, well, oh, the open exposed part. So the ice thickness here is about a kilometer and a half. So you're going to see ninety percent of that. So, um, because ice, uh, the density of ice is about nine, uh, 910 kilograms, or, or, about 10 feet or, or 10 feet? No, you're actually, yeah, you're seeing about, uh, well, if it's a, it's about a kilometer, you're seeing about a hundred, hundred meters, right? The hundred meters right there. So but. Is, this, is this a normal phenomenon, but it's just increased? Yeah, so calving is a normal phenomena, um, and the, what's really neat about calving is it's, a dynamic, non-cyclic uh, non behavior. So it's sort of random, but it's random in a pattern. So does it only break off because the glacier is moving toward the ocean? Um, that's, so the glacier is moving toward the ocean, so that's, um, in, and it's in the ocean. And so as that ice sort of moves forward, there are a whole bunch of different forces. Um, the tidal fluctuations can- So if we see a higher rate of calving, mm -hmm. Yes, often that is uh, one of the implications is that you see uh, you're going to increase your calving and you're going to thin your glacier. And so as you thin, you're also going to speed up that glacier. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. We see a river of melt on the ice. Mm -hmm. Um, so there, so uh, there are a lot of these features on the ice sheet, and they can range in size to something you can jump across to something that's the size of the Colorado River. Um, so you can, sometimes you can, most of the time you can sort of, because um, the drainage basins that these streams drain are relatively small, you can generally, if it, you know, it takes you a, a couple miles, but you can go up around to a point where you can cross and you can hop over. But they, no, these aren't all heading to the sea. What they're actually doing is they're draining into those moulins that I mentioned before. So they're on the surface, and then there's going to be an area where a crevasse has opened up, and that water is going to pour into that crevasse, and it's actually going to go through the ice sheet to the bottom of the ice sheet, and then that water is going to move along the bottom of the ice sheet. So Um, I, we have not, um, we generally, when you're on the ice sheet, you're only sort of moving within about five kilometers. Um, so you can often go down to where these streams enter the moulin and you can sort of go back around. So it might take you a little bit longer to get home, but it's not the end of the world because you have 24 hours of daylight. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, you, this calving event probably took place just over an hour. Yeah, let's see if I, if I... Yeah, it's just over an hour. So these happen, they can happen daily, they can happen... Uh, generally during the summer they happen about daily. Um, but then again, you can be sitting out there for, uh, you know, a week and not see a single one, so... <laughs> yeah. Ah, see these lines right here? So these are healed crevasses. So what happens is that when ice goes over sort of a large bump on the bed, uh, you get extensional forces that are essentially pulling the ice apart. So you can get crevasses that form. As that ice moves beyond that ridge, what will happen is that you have more compressive forces and the, um, the crevasses will heal. And then here you can, of course, see all of that black crack I mentioned earlier. Um, no, there's a whole bunch of videos on YouTube that you can go and watch, and people are in boat, boats, like, right up near the calving front, and you just see the boat start to rock. There is no, um, it's, so, interestingly, we can detect these like we detect earthquakes uh, using seismic data, but what is, um, 
they don't often have a significant amount of warning. There, there's no sort of clear uh, you know, seismic signal associated with them. They sort of just happen. Um, I was in the field in 2013, and we were installing a tide gauge to measure tidal fluctuations and, and the amount of how much the water moves with those associated calving events. And you, I heard this, you hear this roaring in the background. And like 10 seconds later, you're like, what's that roaring? And you turn around, and you see these hu this huge iceberg like, rolling over. You have up to a meter. The water was moving up and down about you know, a meter. Yeah, so they're very powerful events, um, but we don't, we're not, you know, most of, I mean, as, so there's the saying, there's old glaciologists and there's bold glaciologists. <laughs> so we tend to be very careful. Um, often you can't even get really that far near, um, either via helicopter or you can have a boat, but you're still going to be a couple kilometers away. The camera is actually on uh, sort of a ledge here. Um, so this, gla this uh, outlet glacier flows into sort of this area, this fjord area. So this is placed probably three kilometers away from the terminus. So there, is there a drop off right there? Yeah, there's, there you can sort of see the drop off, yeah. <laughs> um, OK. So, that's why mass loss is interesting. Um, it's interesting because it's not just melting. It's not behaving like your ice cream cone, and it's not behaving like uh, a simply water uh, ice cubes in a glass. There are a lot of interplays, as we were just talking about. Um, so basically, I don't know how many people have set foot on a glacier here, but ah, we've got one, <laughs> a few. Um, but Glaciers can really be divided into two areas. Um, everyone who's probably been on a glacier has been in the ablation zone, and that's where the amount of melting exceeds the amount of snowfall on an annual basis. So it's gonna, you're going to have more melting, less snowfall. And then we ha always have an area of accumulation. Um, well, most glaciers have areas of accumulation. There are a few in, um, in Iceland that don't have areas of accumulation. They're all ablation areas. But here, that's where the snowfall is greater than the total melting. And so for a nice, happy glacier, you really want your snowfall plus your melting plus your uh, sort of dynamic loss through calving and other processes to be equal to or greater than zero. But um, you know, all of the ice sheets, you know, the Greenland ice sheet, the West Antarctic ice sheet, the East Antarctic ice sheet, and many, many glaciers all have negative, negative values here. So they're they're shrinking slowly. Um, this is a bit more complicated of an image, but the same principle holds. We have snow falling. It's accumulating over sort of an area. Uh, we can think of this simply as Greenland. And that accumulation is adding weight, and that allows for uh, gravity-driven flow of the ice sheet. Um, and so where it's, you have thickening ice, and you always flow sort of downhill and uh, sort of like this. Um, and here, uh, we can see several processes that are influencing the ice. Here, um, sort of the outlet glaciers, they can be influenced sort of by heat from the ocean. A lot of time, and yes, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, yeah? It's moving beneath the cap. The bottom layer is moving. Yeah, the so. Down and the is moving out. Yeah, so. so exactly. So ice moves in two ways. Well, there are many ways, but two general ways. One is sliding at the bed, um, which is what I'll be talking about most. And, and that's where a good portion of the sliding occurs. But also there's um, internal deformation, too. So ice, um, over long periods of time, uh, is not brittle. It actually flows, just like, uh, just like water flows. Um, and so this ice will flow down. It can be, f it's generally fixed at the bed in sort of, s in some areas, and then it slides in some areas, but it's always moving. And that's what's so neat about glaciers, is they're, they're always moving. Um, so we can have uh, heat from the ocean uh, going underneath these ice shelves or these outlet glaciers, and that increases our melting. And then we can have areas where we have runoff and melt and that melt can reach the bed and increase the sliding um, in certain areas. And that's what I'm going to talk about a bit later. So how can we explore their internal workings? 
Um, so historically, radar has been really important in exploring uh, how glaciers flow and what the internal structure of glaciers look like. Uh, you, um, right now, we do it from uh, NASA runs a program called IceBridge. Uh, they're bridging the gap between two satellites. Uh, they fly thousands and thousands and thousands of kilometers uh, all year round in Antarctica and in Greenland. Um, this is what, and this is a P3 plane. Uh, the radar is located below here, internal in the, uh, in the plane. It sends out radio signals down through the ice, and those radio signals bounce off uh, impurities in the ice and allow us to map those layers. Here you can see the antennas where they receive the returns. This is what that plane looks like on the inside. Uh, it's uncomfortable, it's loud, and it's very cold. <laughs> um, but uh, a lot of people also do radar uh, from the back of a skidoo or even pulling the radar on skis in a lot of small, uh, on a lot of smaller glaciers. Um, and so with radar, uh, what you can do, and so this is actually, I wanted to show you guys this because this is actually yet to be published, but it's work by a colleague of mine um, at the Institute for Geophysics. And what he's done is he's taken all of the radar data from Greenland from 1970 to present and he's interpolated and mapped that data and actually been able to get an actual age structure for the entirety of the Greenland ice sheet. And this is the first time we've been able to do this. So here in green, um, this is recent ice during the Holocene, and here is ice from the last glacial maxima. And then here we have ice from the Eemian, which is more than 130,000 years old. And you can see bits and pieces of this. And these uh, poles that are popping up are the, um, are the, uh, sorry, are the ice cores that we have. And we use the data from the ice cores uh, to actually date the radar layers in, uh, on the ice sheet. Can you tell us some radar, what period? Ah, so that is the thing. So we're going, what, what the, the neat part about this project is it uses the uh, age uh, data from the ice cores, which is determined from ash layers in the ice. And then what you do is you take radar layers that interpret those, or that intersect those ice cores, and you can figure out the age of those radar layers. And then from that, you can take those dated radar layers and extrapolate, well, interpolate to other radar layers. There's a bit of statistics involved, and I don't have a board to draw it, but. Uh, an ice core here, we're talking uh, many kilometers. Yeah, so we, I mean, there's a lot of ice. On the edge, we're at, you know, the ice thickness is about a kilometer. We're talking about 20 kilometers in the interior of the ice sheet. So we have a lot of ice. Yeah? Well, if the ice is moving and you're running a dome for an ice core, uh, does the side pressure ever break? So, the so um, there are various techniques that they use. So first off, a lot of these cores are along the uh, center line of the ice sheet. And that's theoretically where you have flow coming down and moving out, where you have essentially a single line, a single particle line where there's not any flow. So there's very little flow. And then there are a few ice cores that are located out here where, yes, so they, the ice is moving slow enough in the interior that over the course of drilling, it's not that much of a problem. But what's actually really important is to, um, ice deforms relatively rapidly under a lot of pressure. So you actually have to keep the borehole pressurized with antifreeze, essentially, to prevent that borehole from collapsing. Um, and so many of these boreholes that were drilled and these ice cores that were extracted, they've, co they've collapsed long ago. We don't, we have, the ice cores are preserved at the NSIDC in Boulder, Colorado, but we don't, there's no hole left in the ice there. Why would you keep, one open? Why would you keep a, a borehole open? Um, well, it depends. You can, uh, one reason to keep a borehole open is during the drilling process, right? You don't want to lose in your equipment. The other reason to keep it open short term is because you want to allow the, um, because you add a lot of heat when you drill, whether you drill with hot water or with a drill, you're gonna add a lot of heat to the ice. You need to wait a period of time 
to allow that ice around that borehole to equilibrate with the surrounding temperature so you can actually get an accurate temperature uh, in the borehole, so an accurate ice temperature. Yeah. How old is the oldest ice? Go beyond 100 So that's a good question, and we don't really know. Because the ice gets very deformed at the bed of the ice sheet. Um, in fact, in Antarctica, uh, I believe the Japanese are on the hunt for the you know, million-year-old ice. Um, there are a few places where it's theoretically proposed to be, but no one's come close. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so some of it would be below sea level right through here, um, but what's really neat is that um, if the ice was removed, we're going to have a lot of isostatic rebound. So the ground is actually going to, yeah, the ice is pushing it down, and actually we can, there's measurable results now that indicate that the mass loss that we've been having in Greenland is causing significant uh, bed uplift in Greenland and in the surrounding area, uh, enough that we can measure it with GPS units. So, are there any more questions? <laughs> yeah, go for it. <laughs> Is there an estimate for the total weight of the ice in Greenland or Antarctica? Ooh, I'm sure there is an estimate of that weight. Um, we know the mass, so, and we know the approximate density of ice, so we could figure that out. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that is actually uh, really, so there are often uh, areas, especially in alpine glaciers, that can act sort of almost as eddies, um, like, uh, like you see in a stream where the ice might be a bit more still, where it's not sliding at the bed and it's not really deforming internally. Um, in uh, you know, of course, we see that in, in Greenland as well. We see areas where uh, it's actually frozen at the bed, and you can start to see layers that sort of fold over themselves as the ice is deforming above it, but it's frozen at the bed. So, of course, you know, the ice does move in general, but it's not very, yes? So the differences there are that the radar is picking up the density. Uh, so, yeah, they're looking at density differences, and they're looking, uh, so reflectance will also be based on chemical differences in the ice. So, um, and one of the causes of chemical differences is sort of dust in the atmosphere. There's a layer um, of ice in Greenland that's called the Wisconsin layer, and has a much higher, um, much higher uh, dust content. So much higher, sort of like as a more sulfates, more acids along those ice grain boundaries, and so one, it deforms a bit more, and it's very, very, it's a very, very bright signal in the radar data. Mm-hmm. For uh, formed during the Wisconsin, yeah. Um, so, of course, we have ice cores, and then more, uh, to look at more recent changes, we can actually use snow pits. Um, so these are great, uh, you dig a big box, you dig a big box next to it, you allow the sun to shine through it, and you can see your annual layering. And you can also see where you might have wind-blown layers here. This is, ac this is actually sort of a dune that's been cut off, so you can actually see that in the data. Um, and then also, of course, glacial geology, we can use terminal moraines. Yes. For ice cores, mm -hmm. I know that the data from those aren't good unless the ice is packed enough and you have to go a certain depth. Exactly. So, um, you have, so right, that's the transition from snow to fern to ice. And so ice is essentially compacted snow. And um, generally, um, at, at the summit of Greenland, I don't know the exact depth, but half a kilometer, maybe a kilometer. There's a lot of fern That's how deep you have to go before, before you really hit ice. Okay, then how many years ago does that 
that is not my area of expertise and I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. It can vary, obviously, based on the accumulation rate, whether you're getting more snow or less snow. Do you have uh, decades old numbers on how much snowfall Greenland has seen? There, um, ah, so um, we do have data on the snowfall. Um, Greenland uh, actually sort of at the summit is uh, there's been an increase in accumulation, so we're getting more snow. Um, but that's counterbalanced by significantly more melting. But I don't know those numbers off the top of my head. I work in a, well, a much different area than the summit of Greenland. So more modern behavior can be measured from satellites. Um, in the past uh, two decades, we've finally been able to use satellite data to uh, look at both the elevation and the mass uh, of the ice sheets. And then um, I work with GPS data, which are much more like a pinpoint, but you can get incredible temporal resolution. I can look at my GPS data, and I actually can resolve uh, fluctuations in the ice speed on the order of an hour or less. Um, the neat thing that is hip in the glaciology community right now is using drones, um, just like everywhere else. <laughs> so, uh, but drones are really neat um, when you're working on small glaciers and in very particular regions because it allows you to get much better temporal resolution than you can with a satellite. So you can fly over, take tons of photos, go back out in a week, take a ton more photos, and you can, you, you can orthorectify those photos, find their elevation, and then create a digital elevation map from that, a digital elevation change map from that. Another thing that they're using drones for is to just simply map areas of dark, dark ice versus light ice and how that changes from year to year. Um, so that's important in terms of the albedo. And I, I do love this photo from a colleague of mine. You can see the field camp. These orange dots are everyone's tents. Um, they also use um, uh, essentially remote operated submarines and boats to measure um, the temperature of the water in superglacial lakes or map the uh, interface between the ocean and those outlet glaciers that I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> it depends, it really depends. So um, we have, so the great thing about drones is um, you can do it on the cheap. So often people will do it with their startup money that they've been given from the university. Um, this, uh, this boat here uh, was funded by uh, NASA and what they're actually doing is they're using the data, using this temperature data from this boat to actually calibrate satellite data so that we can then use the satellites to actually determine the temperature um, of those superglacial lakes. But this is sort of small scale, just sort of beginning kind of investigation things in terms of the drones. Um, or grad students pay for them on their own. I know a few who have their own and just take them out into the field. Oh yeah, take them out in the field, why not? I mean. <laughs> Um, and then I'll also be talking today about some of the drilling that we did. Um, it's very different than ice core drilling. It's hot water drilling. So we're actually melting away the ice. We pressure, we take superglacial water, put it into basins, then pump it through these modified car wash heaters. So you pressurize and heat the water, and then you pump it through these pipes and then down into a hole. And from these boreholes, we can begin to look at what the subglacial sediments look like. And then um, what I'm really interested in is what the subglacial pressures are doing. So what that water layer at the bottom of the ice sheet is doing and how pressurized is it. So we'll just you know, talk about both GPS and subglacial measurements. Um, and then here, I'm gonna focus just on the ablation zone where, where we'll be. Uh, where we don't have any snow uh, during much of the year. Um, so uh, all of that meltwater up to, in my study area, there's up to six meters of ablation a year. So we're talking, you know, 18 feet of melt of the ice surface. 
um, can accumulate in superglacial lakes. It flows through these superglacial streams. And then often what happens is it uh, enters these moulins. Uh, and these moulins are just, uh, they're formed when you form a crevasse and then you start pouring a lot of water into that crevasse. Um, and you have, that water carries with it a certain amount of heat, so you begin to melt open a larger cavity. And so that's how you form a moulin. These moulins can be active for multiple years. So they'll drain water to the bed of the ice sheet over multiple years, and then they'll close up. Um, and then you have crevasses here. They can reach the bed, but they often don't. They'll be water filled. Um, and so you have these sort of three features. The ones we're really going to focus on today are these lakes and these moulins. Um, and then that water enters those moulins. Here you can see it as we're going to see a video of it. This is a superglacial lake. The, uh, the water, because it's more dense, is going to hydrofracture the ice and move along the bed. And it can act as this lubricating layer here. So you get uh, increased ice speeds during the summer when you have a lot more water at the bed. You can think of it just simply as when you have rain on your highway, right? It becomes a lot slicker. Um, so that's why melt matters. It's not just because melt is melting off of the surface that we're losing mass off the surface of the ice sheet, but water is getting to the bed of the ice sheet in, a, in, in regions uh, in, the in the ablation zone, and that's causing uh, the ice to speed up. So here is sort of one of the very first sort of GPS study in Greenland. It was only done in 2002. Pretty incredible, huh? Um, here we have the horizontal ice velocity measured from a GPS station. So it's just what, how you do this is you take uh, every 15 seconds or every, you know, three hertz, your GPS station is going to talk to your satellites, log its position, and we'll continue to do that and you can use a differencing to determine how fast the ice is moving. Um, so in 96, 97, 98, and 99, we see a, an increase in our peak velocity. And then here, we have uh, what's called a positive degree day. And that's simply just a quantification of the amount of melt on the ice. We like to call things sort of weird, weird, weird names, positive degree day. It's uh, some quantification of when the air temperature is above zero and for how long it's above zero. Um, so we can think of it just simply as something like this. As we increase the amount of melt, we're going to increase our ice speed, right? So we have a quasi-linear relationship. Um, and that means that, you know, perhaps our subglacial uh, system looks something like this. So here we have the bed of the ice sheet, and then here we have the ice sheet sitting on top of it. We have these bedrock bumps or cobbles, um, what we call till, so just a bunch of sediment sitting at the bed of the ice sheet. Um, what the till, what the sediment looks like in Greenland is anyone's guess. We're still trying to figure out what that is. Um, and then we have a water layer, and that, as that water layer increases in thickness, you're increasing the pressure, and more importantly, well, you're increasing the pressure, and you're essentially lifting the ice off of those bedrock bumps, and that allows it to slide more rapidly. So you increase your water level, you increase your sliding. And this is um, sort of a classic example of that on an alpine glacier. This is measured depth to water, so, it, so from the surface, so closer to the surface, the higher the velocity. But you can see between year to year, um, on the same glacier, you can have a different relationship. Yes, Steve? So the water that's down there, do we have any idea how much of that is melt water that's come down, or the bottom where uh, the pressure has melted? Yeah, so um, water at the, of course, um, in Greenland, a lot of ice at the bed is at the pressure melting point. So it's, gonna, it's liquid water at a high pressure. That's a very small amount. Um, in Greenland, um, in my study area, the average discharge of, uh, of the drainage basin, which is uh, probably 10, uh, 15 uh, kilometer, square kilometers, is 27 uh, cubic meters per second. So. Uh, I don't, off the top of my head, have a way to quantify that, but it's significantly more, orders of magnitude, more than the melting produced just from uh, water, the ice being at the pressure melting point. So, this room, the capacity of this room, mm -hmm. 
is. Would you guess it's more or less than that 27? 27 cubic well, it meters. Less, it would actually be less than that. Wouldn't it? it would probably be less than that, but we're only over about 10 kilometers squared. But, you know. It, I mean, it's a lot of water. The amount of melt from the pressure melting, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, but it's, it's minimal compared to the amount of water we get going into these moulins. So we all, but as scientists, right, we're always going out and we're trying to find the inverse relationship. Can we actually prove something wrong? And of course, in Greenland, it's a complex system, we do that. So here are multiple GPS stations um, between 1990 and 2005, and they've been plotted as their average annual velocity in meters per year. And then here, over the same time period, we have the surface mass balance for this particular study area. And so if you have a more negative surface mass balance, you're having more melting on the surface. So when you have more melting in this study, we're actually seeing a gradual decline. We're seeing it increase in melting, but a gradual decline, especially in this blue and this uh, pink GPS station. So a relationship might be something more like this, increasing melt and increasing ice speed. And this was a conundrum in glaciology for a number of years. Uh, why do we see both relationships? Why do we see a positive relationship and why do we see a negative relationship? Um, and the idea was formed that we're transitioning between that nice thin water layer at the bed uh, to something more channelized, right? So we're able to more effectively conduct a lot of water to the bed, uh, along the bed of the ice sheet without influencing uh, large regions of that interface. So we have this relationship, and I just wanted to get to this slide and, because I want to pay attention to time. And I've, um, but here, uh, you can see where we might have something like a, a, a sheet layer but then as you sort of uh, add more and more water, you're going to develop hydraulic gradients that are really uh, conductive to forming a channelized system. So all of that water is going to move into that channel and it's going to be conducted through the system much more efficiently. And so you're going to actually slow down your ice speed. So perhaps in some areas, what you're seeing is that we never actually reach the channelized system, but we only see this sort of I, this layer, this water layer system. And in other areas, you're transitioning from this layer system that's probably present during the winter to a more channelized system in sort of mid to late summer. Um, so this is the field area that I was working in, and I'm just going to sort of click through this. We can see the ablation area right here. It becomes more clear in 2002. And then in 2003 here, you can see it again. Um, actually, in 2012 now, this ELA, so this, this is the ablation area, this is the accumulation area, is more up here right now. So we're seeing a rapid um, ad, uh, advance up glacier of this uh, ELA, of the equilibrium elevation. Uh, here is Jakimsavn Isbre, which, um, you know, I always like to throw a little urban legend into my talks, uh, supposedly calved the iceberg that sank the Titanic. Um, I have, I mean, it's definitely an urban legend. <laughs> um, but we're going to be working in a much smaller area. So the ice here is moving on the order of two to three kilometers a year. The ice in our field area is moving about 100 meters a year. So much, much slower, but it's still moving. Um, and then here's our field site. Our ice is moving in this general direction. Um, it's both land terminating in our study area and a bit ocean terminating. We have ice thicknesses between about 400 and about 1,000 meters. Um, and then I was going to spend a little bit of time where you guys can start at, like, I'm just going to go through how we get to Greenland, because there's actually no direct commercial flights from the United States to Greenland, if anyone's ever looked. Um, so if you fly commercial, you can bounce to New York or um, Atlanta, then fly to Copenhagen, then fly to Iceland, and then fly to Greenland. It takes about four days. Um, or what we often do is we fly with the 109th Air National Guard. They're the only guard unit, or only actually military unit um, in the U.S. that uh, flies uh, ski planes. So here's our general uh, trip. We go Austin, New York, to Goose Bay, Canada for a short stop, Karen Luswak, Greenland, Ululasat, and then we're on the ice. 
In Austin, we deal with a lot of equipment, making sure things work. Um, and then once we get to New York, we get to fly. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of military planes, so I really enjoy these flights. Uh, you fly in a modified C-130. Uh, you can just barely see the skis here. Um, and it's nice and crowded. Um, I find the jump seat significantly more comfortable than commercial air flight. A C-130 from New York to Kangaroo-Sack is about five hours. Um, on an on a actual uh, jet, uh, it's about three. <laughs> um, if you're lucky, you can hitch a ride home on a C7, an empty C-17. Uh, that was probably the oddest experience of my life. Just me and a friend sitting in one of the jump seats, chatting with the guys. Uh, we actually got to go up into the cockpit while they landed in New York. It was a really great experience. Um, so we arrive in Kangalooswak. It's actually um, an abandoned uh, military facility. It's the only runway in Greenland that's long enough to, large, uh, to land the large commercial planes or the C-130s. The only other place that they land in Greenland, which is hilarious, is they practice landing on the ice. So the C-1, go ahead. Abandoned military from what era? Um, from World War II. Uh, so we actually had several bases in Greenland. Now we only have Thule, which is up um, very near the tip of Greenland. Um, but it was, it was occupied during World War II. Um, and that's the most fascinating thing. Uh, you have US power, not European power, only in Kangaroo Slack. Um, everywhere else you have 220. Um, it's a nice little town, very small. Um, we stay in sort of modified military bunks, uh, you can see here. Um, and then we're there for about a day or two, and then we take um, Air Greenland is the only commercial carrier in Greenland. Uh, we take a small plane that's called a Dash. Um, it seats about 25 people, and we hop up uh, to Lulisat. And if you ever end up going to Lulisat, it's, or sorry, to Greenland, you'll probably end up going to Lulisat. It's um, a World Heritage Site. It's a beautiful area. Um, they have sled dogs, uh, which are not pets. Um, and then, <laughs> um, so, uh, so it's beautiful, but what we often do is we spend about three to seven days just dealing with the cargo that we've shipped up. Um, we ship essentially all of the equipment that we need to stay on the ice for up to six weeks. Uh, we have all of our scientific equipment here. You can see spools of cable. Uh, we have our generators to power, essentially, our computers um, and to charge batteries. We use solar panels as well. We carry survival bags with us, um, essentially, at all times. You carry a tent, two sleeping bags, enough food for four days, um, a stove, and some way to stake down your tent. Um, I've never been stuck out on the ice, um, but we have been delayed in being picked up for about four days, depending on the weather. Yeah. Yeah, so um, generally the ice sheet where we work is pretty flat, so you can comfortably walk around and just simply crampons. Um, but when we're doing any work uh, near one of those moulins or those superglacial streams, you're always roped up. Um, all of us are uh, trained in wilderness survival and in wilderness first aid. Um, my husband is also a glaciologist. Um, he did not do well in wilderness first aid. He's afraid of blood. Um, so I'll save him, but he might let me go. Um, <laughs> but uh, we are very, of course, very safe, and we're all trained in that. And that's something, you know, again, old or bold, take your pick. Um, but it is, um, it can be daunting to think of absolutely everything you will need for six weeks, um, and any potential uh, issues you have. Say your instrument doesn't work, uh, you might be opening the back and trying to figure out how to get it to work. So um, we go on the ice via helicopter. Um, you're dropped off. It can be up for a day or up to six weeks. So six weeks without a shower, a lot of fun. Um, but um, really what you do, you set up your camp. But we spend a lot of time moving things, hauling things, making things work. And I, al I always throw this photo in because people are always interested. Uh, to go to the bathroom, yeah, you, your toilet is a five-gallon bucket. This is a very nice toilet setup, one. You, not everyone can see you go to the bathroom. <laughs> Two, you have a styrofoam uh, toilet seat, so it's not frigid. Um, 
And then what you do is you take your five-gallon bucket filled with a little water, do your business, and you go dump it down one of those moulins I mentioned earlier. <laughs> So in Greenland, um, it's plus and a minus. The temperature is generally right at the ice surface. It's freezing. But um, once, you know, standing up here, this was in May, so it was a bit colder. But here, about 34, 36 degrees, almost consistently. Um, the worst part about that is when you have precipitation and it falls as rain. Um, that's, uh, that is the only time that we've ever been stuck in our tent, is when it's been raining on the ice sheet because it is cold and you cannot get dry. Um, so in 2011, so we'll go back to, so these are sort of our fun photos. We'll go back to um, our field site. In 2011, we put out um, 11 GPS stations on the ice and one base station. The problem with these stations is you might leave it like that and you come back three months later and that's what it looks like. You have so much ablation, so much melting of that ice that you have an antenna that's well above your head when you show up. Um, so we start with you know, just our basic GPS stations that you can buy. Um, you can, actually, my odd neighbor has one on his roof. Um, but you can, uh, these are a bit more complicated than uh, your cell phone. Um, these uh, will track up to 20 different satellites and we can use the orbits of those satellites to locate them um, within uh, a millimeter or two. So uh, into a helicopter set up on the ice, it ends up like that. But um, one time we had a bit of free time um, when we were setting up a station. Uh, this was on the way back uh, in 2013. We did a series of GPS on the ice. Um, and so essentially you're just flying from point to point and you're setting up these GPS stations. We were on the way back. So we had a nice number of people, um, but you can actually see the GPS being set up in almost real time. It takes, even with six people, it takes about an hour. And it'll play again. Uh, what happens is you see this guy in orange, he's got a drill, and he's drilling down. He's inserting flights that are about a meter deep. We, uh, and they attach to each other. We go about six to seven meters into the ice. We're going to do that twice, then we're going to stick in this pole, you see, well, right there, we're going to see it again. The pole goes in. Um, we've, these are five foot length poles, that's the longest you can fit into the helicopter, five foot lengths. Um, and then you lower them into the ice. Uh, and then that allows for the solar panel to lower and the GPS antenna to stay fixed while the surface is lowering over time. Both the, pa the solar panel and the GPS antenna are attached to this box that is filled to the brim with marine batteries um, and a GPS unit you can see right there in orange. So it can be sort of a tedious process, but it looks pretty neat once it's done. Um, in 2012, so you get sort of a feel of different field seasons. In 2012, we installed boreholes at two locations. Uh, we did hot water drilling. Um, here are some of the sensors just laid out on the ice. You try managing 600 meters of cable. Uh, it's pretty exhausting. Um, and if you get tangled, you never get it untangled. Um, so here's the hot water drilling I was talking about, the system hot, um, pumps. Uh, how much time do you, like, when should I end? Because I can... We don't have any time limit. It's just when you get tired of talking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just wanted to make sure, I just wanted to judge. Um, I mean, I could talk about this forever. But so from here, this water goes into this black hose. The hose is a kilometer long, and it's hot water is pumped through the hose, over the winch, and down into the hole. Uh, these holes end up being about this big. Um, and you have to instrument them. Uh, it takes about seven hours to drill one of these holes. And you have to instrument them within two hours of drilling them. Because as soon as you take out that, um, take out that cable, that act, the, uh, sorry, the, the hose, that hole is going to start to creep closed. And so if you don't get your sensors in before it creeps closed, you've wasted a lot of fuel drilling a hole uh, that you can't instrument. But you want to leave them frozen in the ice. Yes, exactly. So you do want your instruments to freeze in, yes but you want to get your instruments in before they freeze in. 
before the borehole freezes in. Um, boreholes are sort of a classic way to study the subglacial hydrology. Um, they've been done uh, many times on alpine glaciers. People will drill holes all over an alpine glacier. Um, in green, and they've done it a few times in Antarctica. This is only the second or third time that anyone's attempted to drill in Greenland. Um, but we were able to install pressure transducers. But I do, uh, the one drawback of boreholes is you don't really know where you're going to end up at the, on the bed. You know it's vertical. You don't know what the hydraulic system is going to look like. So oftentimes you can drill a borehole, install a pressure transducer, and the pressure transducer reads a static level for the entirety of its life. And then other times you can install it and it, you see diurnal variations in water pressure on you know, 10, 20 meters. So the, you, it's not ideal to be in the inactive system, but it's always nice to realize that you know, not the entire bed of the ice sheet is actually active. So we, um, uh, you can't really see this really well. So what we did is in 2012 is we used um, nature's boreholes, these huge moulins, and we're going to instrument them with pressure transducers, with pressure sensors as well, to measure the water level in these moulins. And we know they're in an active part of the bed, right? They're draining, you know, three cubic uh, meters of water per second, a lot of water going in. Um, and they're all over. And we know if they reach the bed because we can look at radar data and we can see them. So here is a radar gram, um, a very simple radar gram. Here you can see the bed of the ice sheet right here, and you can see some of the internal layers of the ice right here. And then what you see is you see these reflectors, right? And that's the radar, not essentially, the radar returns didn't essentially know what to do with that open water-filled space. And so you see those parabola. Um, what's really neat, you know this is a moulin, because you see these layers down warping right near where that moulin is. So that means you're removing mass right there from melting. So we know we're getting water going down to the bed. That water is interacting with the ice and adding melting, and then it's going to flow along the bed there. Yeah, Steve. So those are, that's rock there. This is rock right here, and yes. And the different layers in the rock are different? Uh, probably, um, probably different. Uh, well, so in Greenland, you're, I mean, you're, most of it's metamorphic, so you're not going to have really strong layering. Um, it could be that this really, this sort of really strong reflector is evidence of water at the bed there. Um, that's also a case. Water reflects a lot of, a lot of radio waves. Um, but yeah, so you will see uh, that sort of strong reflectance of water being at the bed. Um, I couldn't tell you if that's layering in the actual rock. So yeah. That, how much of a slice is this way? Is it this way? here? Yeah. So in and out of the screen. Like, oh, in and out of the screen. Yeah. Is that a, just a? So this is just a slice. Yeah, that's what I mean. So a slice like that. Oh, it's a, yeah. You can think of it as a cross, just a, simply as a cross section, right? You just cut it, and you're you know how if you cut a layer cake, you can see the layers. That's essentially what this is. So there's no three dimensionality. To the, there probably is a three-dimensionality to it. Uh, there is a three-dimensionality to it. Um, well, my question was that how much distance does that slice represent? Um, depending on your willingness to interpolate, um, generally, uh, we, when you're doing radar on a skidoo, it's probably every kilometer. So for us, this would represent probably a kilometer in the z direction. So that's those Yes, yeah, exactly, exactly. You can't as, you know, right, your swath, uh, your radar swath is not going to be a single line. It's going to be a swath. So you can get slightly different reflections from that, too. Thank you for reminding me. Um, so people have tried to instrument moulins. It's pretty hard, though, because these moulins can be, uh, they are, they're relatively vertical, but they can twist and turn. And you can get uh, drop pools. Let's see what I have next. Um, and you can see that here. Um, I have a good friend who is crazy. Um, and he goes down into these moulins after the end of the melt season. Oh, 
there's somebody else that Yes, that's even further <laughs> down. Yes. Uh, my, fa my favorite story of his is he was working in the Himalaya, and he was in one of these moulins. And in the, uh, in the Himalaya, some, you tend to get channels that are more horizontal. And so they were squeezing through this channel in the ice. And then he said on the way back, they could barely fit out because the ice is actually creeping closed as you're moving through it. Gives me the heebie-jeebies every time I hear that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but as you can see, these are pretty large at the surface. Um, they're going to be pretty large throughout. They're draining a lot of water. Um, so here is just a, sort of a spatial setup. And now we're going to get more into the data. So if you want to leave, you're more than welcome. But I'm going to try to put together sort of an interesting uh, story uh, from the data. So we have these three moulins that we instrumented. Uh, this one, this Fox Moulin. Uh, Fox is uh, the name of our field site. Uh, GPS have a four-letter call. Um, and ours are named after Arctic animals. So we have fox, hare, gull, um, duck. So uh, we had three moulins instrumented, fox, moulin three, moulin four. We had in this, at this location, we had three boreholes that we instrumented with pressure transducers. And then we had a GPS and a weather station. And so now what I'm going to do is just show you um, a clip of data from the GPS station. And I'll walk you through and see some of the features that we see. So this is from 2011. This is a GPS. Uh, this is the ice velocity as measured from one GPS point. Um, what I've done is I've normalized the ice velocity to the background, uh, sort of the average ice velocity. Uh, so anything in the white area is going to be faster than average. Anything in the gray area is going to be slower than average. Um, day uh, 130 is about beginning of May. Uh, about day 230 is sort of end of, Octo end of August, beginning of September. So what's really neat about the GPS data is it's sort of chugging along through May. And then right beginning of June, we see uh, we have temperatures that get above zero. We start melting on the surface. We get this rapid pulse of water through the system. And we see this rapid increase in ice velocity, up to you know 200%, almost 250% of the ice velocity. Then we can see periods here where we have something like a lake drainage. So lake drainages are really local. So you're not going to see them that often uh, in your GPS records. But we were lucky enough to catch it here. You have a superglacial lake. It drains in two or three hours. Uh, it, uh, essentially, the Niagara Falls going through the ice sheet in two or three hours. Um, and that can cause really localized perturbations in the ice velocity. And then we can also have things like rain events, which can increase our ice velocity because you're adding a lot more water. Um, but what I'm really interested in is see this sort of odd gradual decline. Um, so we're transitioning from really you know, pretty high velocities down to low velocities that are lower than our background, lower than our average ice velocity. Um, so it's been proposed that this uh, sort of gradual decline is that transition between this sheet-like system and this channelized system. So despite the fact that during this, uh, during this time, melt is relatively consistent, we're actually seeing uh, a decrease in ice velocity. And we, uh, it's been proposed in a community that it's that transition between these two types of systems. Um, so there's a lot of evidence for that. Well, there's some evidence on Greenland for it. This is from a dye tracing study. So essentially, you take rhodamine dye or other types of dye, a large volume of it. You dump it into one of those superglacial streams. It goes down into the moulin and out on the bottom of the ice sheet. And you can measure that sort of the time it takes for that dye to arrive at the front of the glacier. And so here, um, they, they did it four times. This uh, group did it four times. And uh, early in the season, in mid to late June, it takes about 60 hours for that dye to travel about 10 kilometers. Um, and then we can see that it gets progressively shorter. And then here, it takes less than a day for that 
uh, for that dye to travel uh, about 10 kilometers. So we can see that it's actually it's really changing subglacially. Like something is happening that's causing the dye and causing the water to move more quickly. And that's where you know we think we can think of it something like this, where we have drainage increasing drainage efficiency or bigger channels, and we have increasing ice speed. So we can see as you increase your drainage efficiency, you're more able to conduct that water right rapidly at the bed. You can decrease your ice velocities. And this should really start to manifest itself as decreasing subglacial water pressures, right? Because as you're more efficient, you're not building up that water in the subglacial system. So you um, will have lower subglacial water pressures or lower subglacial water levels. Um, these are just some motivating questions I'll skip through. Um, here is the temperature data. Again, you can see that you know, in Greenland, you never think on sort of the edge of the ice sheet you're staying um, above freezing for several months. Um, everyone tends to be pretty surprised by that. We can see in our velocity data here in black and then in gray, this gradual decline. And then here are our borehole and our moulin pressure results. So hydraulic head is just a measure of the water level in those moulins and in those boreholes relative to zero datum, so relative to sea level. Um, in blue are three moulins, and then in pink and red are our boreholes. And you can see their behavior. Yeah, Steve. What is the y axis? The y axis is hydraulic head. So that it, essentially it's uh, water pressure. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then here is velocity, here's temperature. Um, and you can see that they're behaving pretty differently. The moulins, the water level in those moulins are varying by 100 meters, by 300 feet a day. You're going up and down as you add more water into the system. So this is where things get a little complicated and feel free to just interrupt me. So what we're trying to do is determine is that uh, is the, our decline in velocities that we see in our study area, that gradual decline, the result of increasing channelization or increasing efficiency. So are we getting bigger channels relative to the amount of melt going into the system? So what I've done is I've taken the hydraulic head in dark blue here, uh, so the water level in dark blue, and then I've taken the ice velocity in gray here, and I've plotted it uh, a bit differently. I've plotted hydraulic head against the ice velocity at the same period of time, and I've plotted the maximum for the day and the minimum for each day through the period of time that we have observations. So from day 190, uh, mid, early to mid-July, to day 240, so the end of the melt season, the end of, um, the end of uh, August, beginning of September. And what you can see here is that daily, we have sort of that po a positive relationship. But if you look over the season, we have uh, hysteresis. So we have where early in the season, we have uh, for a given hydraulic head, for a given water pressure, we have higher ice velocities. And then later in the season, for that same hydraulic head, we have lower ice velocities. So I'm going to try to break it down into two sort of simple plots here. So daily, right, we have this great remind, so increasing melt and then increasing ice velocity, we have this positive linear relationship, at least from our minimum to our maximum. One thing that we have seen previously in data. But what we don't see is we don't see an increasing drainage efficiency and uh, decreasing ice velocity. So we don't see this relationship. And I'm going to try to explain this um, as clearly as I can. So here, if you look at the maximum hydraulic head over the course of the season, it's not varying very much. It's varying maybe over 20 meters, very small amount for, uh, for these moulins. But our ice velocity is going from about 150, maybe 180 meters per year um, down to 60 meters per year. So the ice is decelerating despite the fact that we have relatively constant uh, peak moulin head, peak hydraulic head, peak water pressure. So we don't actually see this relationship. We don't see a decrease in the water pressure associated with a decrease in the ice velocity. Yes? Mm -hmm. 
Yes, in winter. Do the channels get crushed out of existence, or do they hang around so they can get larger the next year? Ah, so that is a question that we're trying to answer. Um, most of us operate on the idea that they essentially creep close, they collapse once all the water's been evacuated. So you're starting fresh every year. But there's been recent evidence that suggests that um, in that sediment at the bed of the glacier, you create, um, you're removing a lot of that fine material as water's moving through it. So you're getting uh, more porous material. So you're creating a hydraulic low, essentially, where water can more easily flow and so that actual physical channel in the ice might not be there, but there's some um, remnant information on the bed of the ice sheet so that uh, those channels begin to form in the same spot year after year, even though they're sort of erased by the ice. So we don't see that relationship. More of what we see is we see sort of an independence. We see a decrease in ice velocity over the season without much change in our drainage efficiency. So what does that mean? Well, it means that our channels aren't doing much during our observational period, that they're not increasing in size rapidly, they're not decreasing in size rapidly. They're staying pretty stable, and they're adjusting to the available melt relatively rapidly. So, but we still see that decrease in ice velocity, so that suggests that perhaps the, our, our current theory on how this decline in velocity happens can't really explain what happens in the late season. So instead, um, you know, we don't have data for here. We don't have data at the beginning of the season. So we're not going to try to make any predictions about what happens here. In fact, I would say we probably transition from a, from a very inefficient ice uh, water layer at the bed of the ice sheet to a more channelized layer. But uh, in our paper that we published, we hypothesized that this, uh, for at least a large portion of the melt season, those channels aren't really becoming more efficient. They can't conduct uh, water at a more rapid rate. Um, they're not draining the ice sheet in any sort of more efficient manner. But instead, what's happening is that the system as a whole is changing. So we're not changing just to this channel. But we have a system where you have a channelized system, you have this efficient system, we have an inefficient system, and then we have an isolated system where I'm not showing the data because of time, but a lot of our boreholes ended up, where we don't actually see very much diurnal variability in the water level, but over the course of the season, we actually see a gradual decline <coughs> in that pressure. So um, this was, uh, so this is sort of our, this is my conclusion side, essentially, right? We can think of it as maybe three components where, yes, we transition from, um, from inefficient to efficient, but that this channel, this channel cannot, ex these channels, these subglacial channels cannot explain the entire season of declining velocities we see in Greenland. So that is the end of my talk, and thank you guys for staying. And I am here for questions. Go for it. Four parts. Is the overall net loss of ice mm -hmm. um, accelerating? Is the acceleration accelerating? Mm -hmm. um, if everything stays the same and Antarctica doesn't melt, mm -hmm. Okay, so I will work backward. The amount of ice in Greenland is equivalent to about seven meters of sea level rise. Seven meters of sea level rise. Um, we expect by, let me, oh, oh, oh no, I had, <laughs> don't worry, <laughs> no worries. Um, I well, this is what the problem is, this turned off. Ah, no worries. I was just so gonna. In, in a few minutes, there will be a picture again. <laughs> Sorry. No worries. No worries at all. Um, the predictions for sea level rise, um, generally, um, the total sea level rise in, by about 2100 will be about a meter, around a meter. Um, approximately. So it's one seventh. 
one seventh of Greenland. Um, and then the is so the mass loss is, of Greenland is accelerating. Um, I do not know the derivative of that acceleration, um, but my intuition is that the acceleration is indeed accelerating. Ah, so that's a really good question. Um, at the terminus, um, they are general. They can range in size. So near the front of the glacier, um, they can range in size. Generally, I would say about 20 feet by 10 feet. They're never really circular. They're always sort of half an oval. They're flat. Um, and as you move upstream, I um, so calculations that I've done, some modeling that I've done suggest. They're on a meter, on the order of like a meter squared. So something like this. So these are something below the resolution power of the radar. Exactly. So there is, um, I have a friend who was here at UT and is now um, at Caltech doing a postdoc. He was able in, in Antarctica to use the, essentially the reflectance of the radar um, to determine where, uh, where those channels might be. So essentially, a channel will have a certain sort of refraction element as the radio waves hit it. And then um, sort of a flatter uh, system will have a different sort of scattering pattern. So you could tell where those channels are. But we're sort of not quite at the point of being able to identify those channels um, directly in the radar. The bigger ones, there's some evidence that we can see them, but no so one. Look at the light there. <laughs> oh, no worries. Um, so it can be. Um, so that's the thing is that that's the 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 kicker in this story is that we can't, you know, we can look at where glaciers used to be, but you know, there's been a lot of geology going on. We can't do a really great job of, you know. I mean, it's a lot of interpolation and sort of interpreting very small points of data. Well, do those channels mm -hmm. eat out the, the bedrock? Yeah, so they, um, there is definitely evidence that they do inside the bedrock, right? That they're going inside. We, the Finger Lakes photo that I showed. We'll just start this. Oh, here's that photo of the, the radar. So we can tell where there's water at the bed. Um, so here is something that would be a bit more sheet-like. And then here is where it would be a bit more channel-like. But that's essentially the resolution of what we have. And this is only in one area. It's a pretty experimental new approach. Let's see how fast. I'm pointing at the screen, but I realize it might be a lot easier to point at the actual um, computer. Oh, you know, yeah, reflectance. We're all we're all for reflectance, but you do see inside channels. Um, you see them sort of at the out at the terminus of glaciers, and we do see them where the Laurentide ice sheet would have expected been expected to be. Uh, the Finger Lakes in New York, there are several other examples throughout uh, the Midwest. Do you know why northern Canada doesn't have ice as deep as Great Nesta? Um, well, so Greenland is, uh, one, it's surrounded by ocean. So it, ha it tends to have a more variable temperature. Lands tend to be a bit more stable. Um, there are some ice caps in Greenland. Uh, most def I passed it. I wasn't paying attention. Um, there are some ice caps in um, uh, in Canada, for sure, um, that are multiple kilometers thick. Um, so they're there. Um, Greenland, right, it's sort of in a sweet spot, just like Antarctica. You have low sea level. You have relatively flat bed. It's variable, but flat. And you just begin to slowly accumulate that ice. OK, I can't find the Finger Lakes, but. No Inuit building fires. <laughs> I guess no Inuit building fires. So the Moans, uh, <laughs> that's what 
four that you identified mm -hmm. showed looked like they were less than a mile apart. Yeah, they so are. Are those all over the ice? They ice are. Ice um, yes, those moulins, they are all over the ice sheet. And they drain. We're going to go four holes. So these, yeah, there are lots of them. They're all, so these, all these blue dots are moulins that we've identified in, um, in satellite imagery. And that's, that bar is five kilometers. That's five kilometers right there, yeah. So these are two sites. I didn't show any data from here, but they're about seven kilometers apart. Has that other part not been explored? Um, so um, up here, uh, there is a place called Swiss Camp. Um, which is a long-term, it's probably up here, um, it's a long-term uh, research station, is, uh, no, research camp. Camp in glaciology, camp means that you're living in tents, station means that you don't have to live in a tent. Um, it's, a, it's a research camp um, that's uh, been there since 1990. Um, there are a few weather, there's a weather station here, and a weather station here. Um, and actually, this area has been explored um, because they're interested in building a hydroelectric plant. So they want to build a hydroelectric plant off of this river right here. And they actually started running the power lines about a year ago. Um, so the, the, so Den or Greenland is a protectorate of Denmark, but they operate on their own. They're essentially trying to move to be independent. And the idea is, is that power will allow um, essentially additional settlement in Alulasat, which is a town. It has a population of about 5,000 right now. Um, from here to here, yeah, it's a bit of a ways. They were stringing some pretty impressive power lines. Um, but uh, another thing that's happening in, along the coast of Greenland that a lot of people, are, well, that the Greenlandic people um, are really interested in is that as the ice retreats, you're exposing a lot more of the metamorphic complexes, the rock in the area. And those complexes are going to be rich in things like gold um, and other sort of uh, useful metals. So there's actually a big debate in Greenland on, you know, climate change is kind of good for them, but it's also very bad for their traditional way of life. So somebody with our gold underneath their eyes? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> no, uh, so a lot of, actually, um, when you go, they have, uh, there's a magazine, there's a, a Greenland-specific magazine, and they actually have a competition. Uh, these Danish companies just ask people to bring in, like, cool rocks, uh, and, like, <laughs> yeah, like, where, yeah, exactly, they assay them, and, like, where did you get that rock, and, like, that is actually a big thing in this area. And the other thing is, is they're starting um, oil exploration off the coast. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you said before that you didn't know what the glacial till under this. Mm -hmm. But we see from the ablation that there is land here. There is land, um, so yes, we can. So we can infer what's on the ground there because the ablation yeah, exactly, exactly. So we do infer um, what it, it looks like, and right. So we can think of it as some how I visualize it, and not everyone in the community visualizes it the same way. But you have sort of this pretty hilly surface um, on sort of the ridge tops, on those uh, hilltops. You're not going to have very much till. It's going to be pretty rocky. But in these depressions. Um, like here, you'll have a sort of a large, you might have a thick layer of till. But what the, the composition of that till, it's probably, so we know that the density ranges, or the porosity ranges between 30 and 40 percent, and that covers almost everything um, besides like bedrock. <laughs> um, but it, we can make some inferences for sure, but we also, um, we have to remember that as soon as you remove sort of the ice sheet there, you're going to have, you know, winnowing processes, you're going to have wind, uh, you're going to have more uh, 
hydrologic processes that might alter sort of what this looks like. So this area has probably been deglaciated for you know several thousand years. Um, just probably from about here onward, you know, we've lost maybe the last hundred years. But so definitely we do, and we, we do very much um, utilize what we do see so and make interpretations. When is this, when in the year is, uh, what's that part of Oh, when this is, so this is a satellite image. This was taken in um, 2009 in, July of 2009. And so during the winter, all that brown is covered up. That's going to be covered up by snow. Just, um, just so the amount of snow in the area, um, so here at this site, um, the snowfall is minimal enough and the wind is high enough that when we go in May, so before the melting even starts, we're still on bare ice. Um, but you go up here, and uh, let's see, it took me two hours to dig out the box, the GPS box in May. It was probably about two or three feet of ice, or snow, sorry, and you have to find the box. Mm -hmm. That's the fun part. <laughs> it's like finding a needle in a haystack. Um, so there definitely is snow cover during the winter, but that can be pretty highly variable in this area. No. Uh, ah. Yes. Exactly. Oh, but it, yes, uh, I agree with you at first. But when you go up to these moulins, because you have water moving in, you're changing the pressure, uh, the air pressure in those moulins. So it makes this woof, 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 woof sound, just like you're standing under a windmill. <laughs> <laughs> because he no, he doesn't have a rope on. So yeah, so he is. That, that's Blaine. Blaine was a risk taker. Um, but <laughs> when, <laughs> no, he he still he still happily is a glaciologist. Um, but yes, um, when you're out there for six weeks, you do. He is wearing crampons, which make a huge difference. And we're talking, you know, you put an inch of, of steel into the, into the snow, or into the ice. But yeah, that's not smart. Don't do that. On the electrical question, I would have thought Moulin or Moulins was the list of the connection with waterfall for cattle wheel driving mill rather than windmill. Oh. Yes. Oh, that's a very good point. That, that's uh, a side of the, the lexicon that I had not heard. <laughs> but I appreciate that. No, 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 no. That's, that's, I'm, I'm going to tell everyone that tomorrow at the office. <laughs> oh, it was probably someone in the French or the Swiss Alps, um, because you do have moulins on, in, yeah, in, on small alpine glaciers as well. So that's prob the, the coin, you know, uh, the Swiss Alps and the French Alps are probably the most explored and most researched glacier, uh, glacial areas. So definitely. Is how long the Himalayan glaciers, did they see the four great rivers? Yeah. It's unimaginable to have the same ground. Yeah, so um, I couldn't, I don't do much work in the Himalaya, so I, could, I wouldn't, I don't feel comfortable putting a, sort of a timeline on it. And I also think that the Himalaya are difficult enough to reach. And I know that the study is relatively limited. So we sort of have glacier extents, but we don't have a great idea of sort of what the melt rates are of those glaciers. And we don't have a great ex uh, idea of what the volumes of those glaciers are. So there's been a lot more recent work sort of being poured into the Himalaya. But you think getting to Greenland is hard? Getting to those, I mean, glaciers in the Himalaya are, is much more difficult, significantly more difficult. Well, thank you again. It, <laughs> I'm here to, st I can answer any more questions. <laughs> Greenland.
Finland is a protectorate of Denmark, so they, they're under home rule. That's one of the main colony, and so is there a movement to... There, so it's, yeah, there, there definitely is a movement within Greenland. They're under home rule. Um, the benefit of being a protectorate is, is that, you know, there isn't much in the way of what we consider um, sort of modern employment. So many of the people that I've worked with, that I interact with, right, they're, um, they're, they're hunters, they're fishers. Um, they, you know, drive sled dogs during the winter. They hunt seals. They hunt whales and they hunt polar bear. Um, and uh, there is this move to sort of more tourism-oriented jobs, but even those are very seasonable. So, uh, in fact, each resident of, um, of Greenland actually does receive a stipend from Denmark um, to pay for food and housing. And uh, the population of Greenland, I believe, is 25,000. It's v quite small. It's very small. It's, I mean, if you, um, there are, 